Hello everyone, welcome to the JW Review. My name is Mike Felker and this is the weekly podcast where we review Watchtower articles and compare them to what the scriptures teach. Uh, we will be continuing on uh, in reviewing the uh, August 2021 Watchtower Study Edition and the article is titled, Are You Willing to Wait on Jehovah? Uh, you hear this theme of waiting uh, pretty often with uh, Jehovah's Witnesses. And some of those instances that kind of interest me uh, the most is uh, when there's a doctrinal uh, change uh, on the horizon. Um, and let's say a Jehovah's Witness just kind of uncovers that, that there's going to be a maybe a doctrinal change on the horizon. Uh, they may be counseled to wait on Jehovah, and Jehovah will allow uh, the organization uh, to make that change or uh, whatever correction uh, that needs to be, to be made. And even if it's not on the horizon, um, if a Jehovah's Witness um, kind of makes a discovery that maybe there's an error that the Watchtower has been making perhaps for years, um, they are told uh, to uh, be quiet and uh, wait on Jehovah to correct uh, the organization, and that will uh, happen in uh, due time, whatever uh, that means. So um, that's one instance of waiting on Jehovah that I've heard uh, in times past. And so we'll be getting into a little bit of that here, but there's some other aspects of uh, waiting on Jehovah. Maybe maybe I should put that in quotes um, that we're going to look into. Because what it really boils down to is a waiting on the organization. It's not so much a waiting on Jehovah as it is waiting on fallible, imperfect, error-prone men at the top of the leadership of the Watchtower to make a decision. That's the reality of the situation because uh, I can I can tell you that uh, Jehovah is not directing this organization. He is not disseminating information uh, to them. Uh, this organization has uh, the Bible just like every one of us, uh, the rest of us mortals have, and we have to read that Bible and uh, we have to figure out what it says. So. Um, the Watchtower is uh, reading the Bible and figuring things out, uh, just like the rest of us, with some obviously some very, very uh, important uh, distinctions, because I'm not the one who's opening up my Bible and saying that um, you have to agree with everything that I say in these videos or everything that I put in print, or else you're uh, not a true uh, Christian. Uh, that's not something that uh, that I do. But this men, uh, this group of men up in uh, up in the headquarters of the Watchtower, they say that yes, uh, you must agree with everything that they put in print, and you are not to question it. You are to uh, accept it. If you don't accept it, uh, perhaps you're not trusting uh, in Jehovah. All right, so let's get into uh, this article. Paragraph one. How do you feel when a package... Okay, so (laughs) I'm pausing here because sometimes you wonder if the writers of these articles are very self-aware. I try to be very self-aware when I'm saying things or writing things. I'm not perfect, but I really, really try to be. But I kind of wonder how self-aware these article writers really are. Like, how can they say... (laughs) How can they say these things? But let's, let's, let's read this. How do you feel when a package containing an item that you really need does not arrive when you are expecting it? Are you disappointed? Proverbs 13.12 realistically states, Expectation postponed makes the heart sick. But what if you learned that there are good reasons why the package did not arrive when you expected it to come? In that case, you would likely be patient and willing to wait. Now, this is quite a gem here if you, if you really understand the principle uh, that they're making here. And what is, and what is that, that principle? If you learn there's good reasons why it didn't arrive, whether it's a package or something else, if there's good reasons to know why, something didn't arrive when you expected it to come, in that case, you would be patient and willing to wait. Okay, so if a package gets lost, okay, you can, you can understand how that happens. It happens all the time to all of us. Uh, we totally uh, get that. But what happens when 
an organization of fallible men says this year is going to be the end. And they do it multiple times throughout decades. And the expectations just simply do not happen. Were there good reasons why such and such a date did not fulfill what was promised? Are there good reasons for that? You know, if there are good reasons for that, obviously you know I'm talking about the Watchtower, then please do share with me what those reasons are. What am I talking about? 1914, 1925, 1975, and there's others. Millions now living will never die. Okay, go down, go down the list. Are there good reasons why <laughs> something didn't happen? And please tell me what the good reasons are. Now, I know there's reasons why these dates didn't fulfill what was promised. I know there's reasons for that. Bad, bad, bad reading of the scriptures, of course. <laughs> um, and having way more authority uh, than, than you should have. Um, yeah, um, there are definitely reasons, but are they good reasons? Are they good reasons? So if I work for a shipping carrier and I lose a package, I can have a good reason for doing that. Something as simple as one of my guys forgot to scan the pallet or scan the package. Very simple thing to miss. That, that's, that's a good reason why something didn't arrive on time or maybe the package... Um, fell off the truck and and, and broke. Okay, uh, that that's a that's a good reason. So if your package fell off a truck and broke, it has to get reordered, and you know it's going to take um, as long as for that first package was supposed to arrive. Okay, those are those are those are good reasons. I'm at a loss to figure out a good reason, a good reason why we've had so many failed predictions by this organization. Again, if you know of a good reason, please share that with the rest of us. All right, let's continue on. Proverbs 4.18 tells us, The path of the righteous is like the bright morning light that grows brighter and brighter until the full day. These words aptly apply to the way in which Jehovah reveals his purpose to his people gradually. So let's pull up the verse here. So Proverbs 4.18, The path of the righteous is, li is like the light of dawn that shines brighter and brighter until the full day. Do you see anything in here or anything in the context whatsoever about Jehovah's revealed purposes? Nope, I don't think there's anything about that. Read all the context you want. There is nothing uh, nothing about that. I mean, look at down to verse 26. I think this kind of explains it well. It really clarifies what the verse means. Watch the path of your feet. Well, you watch the path of your feet because you have righteousness. You know you know right from wrong. You're, you're now guided. You have the light of the word. So you can really see your path clearly. And all your ways will be established. Do not turn to the right or to the left. Turn your foot from evil. So again, that clarifies what Proverbs 4.18 means. The light shines brighter and brighter until the full day. You're continually um, becoming more and more righteous, more and more uh, sanctified. You're becoming conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. And that's how the light gets brighter and brighter. You can, you can see your path in front of you, but pa the path is specifically related to righteousness or unrighteousness. And the, the context uh, tells us of what we just read. Turn your foot from evil. has nothing to do with new doctrines getting revealed. Just nothing whatsoever to do with that. And the Watchtower has a, a very long history of taking this verse woefully out of context. But i got to give them credit, at least they said this. However, this verse can also be applied more broadly to the way in which a Christian makes spiritual progress in his life. Well, they're, they're, they're right. 
This verse is about making spiritual progress in this life. That's exactly what the verse uh, is about. But you can't have both. You can't have. You have to pick one. Look at the context. You've got to pick one. This is not about revealed doctrine or new revealed teachings by a group of fallible men or anything like that. Pick one. It's the second one. (laughs) I'll go ahead and answer it for you. It's the second one. It's the way in which a Christian makes spiritual progress in his life. But it's not the other one. It's not that Jehovah reveals his purpose to his people gradually. Because Jehovah is not revealing new things to his people. What's happening is the governing body, this group of fallible men, is revealing things to you. Not Jehovah, but the fallible men. That's what's happening in your organization. So take one, and I'll answer for you. It's the second meaning they give here. If we diligently study and apply the counsel we receive through God's word and his organization, we will gradually develop a Christ-like personality. So they've got to, of course, throw in the organization here. But as we know, the organization makes mistakes. The spiritual food has contaminants in it. Okay? So, take out the organization, and this sentence is great. So if it just said, If we diligently study and apply the counsel we receive through God's word, we will gradually develop a Christ-like personality. That's great. That's great. I think that's what you should do. But don't insert the organization in here like that. You don't need it there. You don't need it there. Paragraph 11. All right, now this this is some major uh, self-awareness problems. That is why we must never blame Jehovah if something does not happen as quickly as we think it should. Notice, Notice the words here. Very, very careful wording. Things should not happen as quickly as we think it should. For example, many have been praying for years to see God's kingdom bring an end to this system of things. Jesus even said that we should pray for this. But how foolish it would be if someone allowed his faith in God to weaken because the end did not come when who? Humans expected it. The end will come at exactly the right time. Notice this. Let's go back. Something does not happen as quickly as we think it should. And then it talks about the end did not come when humans expected it. You see what they're doing here? If you have had certain expectations about when the end would come, let's say you're one of the more aged uh, Jehovah's Witnesses, um, not that aged, I'm not trying to pick on you, but if you if you were an adult during 1975, or the years leading up to 1975, you know exactly what I'm talking about here. Now, whether the organization made extremely declarative dates, um, that's up for discussion, regarding 1975, because as the years drew closer, they kind of backed off a little. They declared the date, but then they started to hesitate a little bit. But they were commending people for selling their possessions or or um, their retirement, emptying out their retirement funds and things like that. People were preparing for the end because of what the organization did, the expectations that the organization set up. But what they're doing here in paragraph 11 is blaming you. Things should not happen as quickly as we think. The rank and file. The way we think it should. And the end did not come because when humans expected it. But who are the ones telling you when to expect it? Who are the ones telling you that we're in the last of the last of the last of the last days? And using the words, the end is soon. The end is near. It's upon us. It's very, very soon. We're in the last days. Who are the ones making those statements? You see, the Watchtower talks out of both their sides of their mouth because, yeah, they'll admit they're humans. 
But this is also God's organization, and Jehovah is directing these men to give you doctrine. So with paragraph 11, you've got to pick which one it is. Is God the one telling you that we're in the last of the last of the last days? Or is it, as this article says, is it the humans who are having the wrong expectations? Which is it? Paragraph 12. What if you became, now we're switching to a different topic here, uh, but what if you became, we're still on patience, but this is uh, specifically about elders. Uh, but what if you became aware of serious wrongdoing by someone in the congregation after the elders have been informed of the matter? Will you leave it in their hands, patiently waiting for them to care for it in Jehovah's way? The question we want to ask here is what scriptural basis do you have for putting it, whatever this is, into the hands of the elders. You see, this paragraph just assumes it. It doesn't actually prove it. It doesn't cite uh, any scriptures for it. It just assumes you're supposed to run to the elders and let them handle it. But what does the Bible say? Because after all, aren't we supposed to be following the Bible? Yes, we are. Let's look at Matthew 18. It doesn't get more specific than this in terms of the objective if you find another believer uh, in sin. So, Matthew 18, 15, these are the words of Jesus. <clears throat> now, if your brother sins, so this is talking about within the church, your brother, go and show him his fault in private. Now, do you see anything here about the elders? No, the elders aren't even in the picture. Go and show him his fault in private. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. But if he does not listen to you, go to the elders. Nope, nope, not even on the second time. Not even on the second time. It says, take one or two more with you, so that on the testimony of two or three witnesses, every matter may be confirmed. And if he refuses to listen to them, go to the elders. Nope, <laughs> not even as the last resort, Jesus doesn't say to go to the elders. It says, tell it to the church. Who tells it to the church? Well, who are the people who confronted these people in sin? That's you, right? And whoever these witnesses are. Tell it to the church. So don't blame me. I didn't say it. <laughs> this is what Jesus is saying. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, he is to be to you a Gentile, and a tax collector. So, no shunning involved here. You treat them like you would anyone else in the world, a Gentile and a tax collector. If you were a Jew, how do you treat a Gentile and a tax collector? It doesn't mean you absolutely shun them with zero interaction. No. They have a different way of treating uh, uh, Gentiles and tax collectors. Okay? The point is, there's nothing here about going to the elders. If you see someone in sin... You take care of it. And if you saw someone else um, uh, observing the same thing, take them with you. Okay? That's the directive here. So if you don't like it, I'm, I'm sorry. Don't blame me. That's, these are the words of Jesus. All right, along the same lines in uh, paragraph 13. When the elders become aware of serious wrongdoings in the congregation, they prayerfully seek wisdom from above so that they can get Jehovah's view on the situation. Now, what you're going to notice here is they cite some scriptures, but none of these scriptures have anything to do with elders. Read them for yourself, and we're going to do that right now. So, James 3.17. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peace-loving, gentle, reasonable, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial, free, free of hypocrisy. Okay, so nothing there about elders. Okay, it says their goal, the elder's goal, is to help the one who's sinning to turn back from the error of his way, if possible. And they cite here James 5, 19. It says, my brothers and sisters, so James is speaking to everyone, if anyone among you strays from the truth and someone turns him back, let him know that the one who 
has turned a sinner from the error of his way will save his soul from death and cover a multitude of sins. So could James be any more explicit that he's referring to the congregation here? Nothing about elders. Nothing about elders. James tells us exactly who he has in mind to confront the sinner and bring him back. You, me, all of us. They, or the elders, also want to do everything they can to protect the congregation and to comfort those who have been hurt. And that's the reason why they have uh, for uh, judicial committees. All right, so they can confront the person in private, oftentimes with uh, no witnesses there. But this I hear, 2 Corinthians 1, 3 through 4, it says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts all of us, who comforts us, us in all our affliction, so that we will be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort which we ourselves are comforted by God. Just like the last one, nothing here specifically about elders, but specifically to you and me and to all of us to take action ourselves. All right, when handling cases of serious wrongdoing, could that be child abuse, child molestation, the elders must first get all the facts, which may take some time. I you got to read between the lines here because we all know we all know it's documented that when it is not legally obligatory or mandated to report oftentimes the elders are doing the investigation that's what's going on here there are documented cases of this if you want to see those for yourself let me know or check out the Australia Royal Commission um, you can see for yourself uh, what happens in this organization with quote unquote serious wrongdoings. Let me just break this down for you. If a serious wrongdoing is potentially a crime, if it's potentially a crime, whether it is legally mandated or not, you should report it to the authorities. Elders are not trained investigators. They are not. Not when it comes to crimes or even potential crimes. They don't have the expertise to do that. So no, don't call the branch office or headquarters asking them what to do. When you, when you find a crime being committed, especially when it involves children, you call the authorities. And it's a shame that the Watchtower does not have the directive in place so when you see a crime, or hear about a crime, that you should report it to the authorities. Don't tell your elders. Don't call the headquarters. You don't need to do that. Okay? So, I hope I was clear on that. <laughs> and it says when they must first get all the facts, it may take some time. Well, yeah, um, especially if you're uh, if you're um, trying to investigate something like child abuse, yeah, it may take some time, and by then it's too late. Especially if it finally makes it, uh, make it makes it to the courts, and the elders took all this time to investigate it. The more time that can pass by, the harder it is to investigate something. That's why it's so important that when you see or hear about child abuse happening that you report it immediately. It's not about you. It's not about this organization. It is about the children. It's about the children. Honestly, screw the reputation of the organization. Real, I, 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 never use, <laughs> I never use language like that, but screw the organization when it comes to protecting reputation and report crimes to the authorities. Please, please, please do that, okay? Then they prayerfully and carefully provide counsel from the scriptures and apply correction to the proper degree. So Jeremiah 30.11. It says, For I am with you, declares Jehovah, to save you. For I will completely destroy all the nations where I have scattered you. Only I will not destroy you completely, but I will discipline you fairly and will by no means leave you unpunished. 
so nothing here once again about elders. Let's continue. Maybe there's something else. Although they do not procrastinate, the elders do not rush to judgment. When matters are handled properly, the congregation will see the greatest good come to all. Yet even when problems are cared for in this manner, an innocent person may still feel hurt. If this is true of you, what can you do to lessen the pain? So this is all totally unnecessary. Um, now, I'm not saying the elders should never uh, get involved. If it concerns the welfare of their congregation, sure, I mean, you can get elders involved. And the reason we know that is because Scripture tells us. Let's go to 1 Peter 5, 1. It says, Therefore I urge elders among you as your fellow elder and witness of the sufferings of Christ and the one who is also a fellow partaker of the glory that is to be revealed. Now here's the directives to the elders. And there's no better directives in the Christian scriptures than this. Shepherd the flock of God among you. So shepherding actually means something. The Greek word can mean feeding. So feed them. Shepherd them. Exercising oversight. Let me see if I can... Okay, yeah, oversight means to see, to oversee, or to take care, to have care. Not under compulsion, but voluntarily according to the will of God, and not with greed, but with eagerness. Verse 3 is very important. Nor yet is domineering, or having power over. So, not that, not that, over those assigned to your care, but by proving to be examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd, uh, chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. So you don't domineer. You don't have power over them as an elder. You don't do that. What do you do? You feed them and shepherd them, and you do this how? Peter tells us, by being an example. Yes, you do preach the word. Of course, you preach, you teach, you give directions. But primarily, you are being examples to your flock. And you're a shepherd. All of this speaks of gentleness. And there's nothing here about what paragraph 13 says. It's just, it's just not there. I'm sorry, it's just not there. If that bothers you, that perhaps elders don't have as much directions and guidance as you thought, well, as I said before, Take it up with the scriptures, because these are the scriptures' directives. If you think perhaps maybe the, the directives should be more strict or more in-depth, again, I didn't write this, right? We're subject to the authority of scripture, and we have to deal with this, okay? But what we do find is that the congregation is way, 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 or should be way more involved than what the Watchtower says, because what the Watchtower wants to do is to give the elders lordship, a domineering lordship over the congregation where they can have these unscriptural, unbiblical judicial committees. So they can control people. That's what they're doing. I know they think they're helping people, but what they're doing is unscriptural. Find me judicial committees in the scriptures. It's not there. So what the scriptures are doing, just in conclusion here, is empowering you, empowering me. These men in the leadership just do not have the control that Jehovah's Witnesses think they have. So be empowered. Confront people, but do so lovingly, okay? Do it lovingly. And that's one thing that I'm trying to do here. Paragraph 14. You can find outstanding examples in God's Word that teach us how to wait on Jehovah to correct matters. I thought it was really interesting they brought this example up. For instance, although jo uh, Joseph suffered injustice at the hands of his own brothers, he did not allow their sins to cause him to become a bitter person. Instead, he remained focused on his service to Jehovah, who richly rewarded him for his patient endurance. Now this is a really, really bad example if you're trying to parallel this 
with the waiting on uh, Jehovah if you're trying to wait on the organization to do something. It's a bad example. Why? Well, because Joseph didn't have control of what was going on. There was nothing he could do. All he could really do was have integrity, but that got him thrown in prison. So what, what did he do in prison? He kept on having integrity, but there was nothing else he could do but trusting in God. I mean, he was in jail, for crying out loud. But when it comes to the congregation in your life as a Jehovah's Witness, you don't have to wait on the organization for these things. Things are in your control. You have the control to correct people, to engage people. If your organization makes errors, you should feel at liberty to offer a gentle, loving, and respectful correction to them. Okay? And that goes for me, too. If I notice um, a, 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 an elder, one of my elders, making an error, I should feel a liberty to lovingly offer him correction. Okay? And the same thing for me. If I'm an error, you or anyone else should be able to come to me and offer me correction. And I'll, I'll listen to you and we can have a discussion about it. But you can't do that with the organization. So in a sense, it's not in your control. But if we're talking about the context of what your life as a Christian should be, the life of a healthy Christian in a healthy environment, you should be able to do that. You should be able to do that. Okay, so we will uh, wrap it up there with that. Uh, next week's article, uh, assuming it's going to be interesting, is titled Strengthen Your Faith in the Creator. So uh, I just wanted to say thank you all for your uh, comments and all of your questions. I really do appreciate that. So uh, as always, if you do have any thoughts, uh, feel free uh, to leave them uh, for me. And uh, you can do that publicly in the comments section, of course. But if you do want to contact me privately, um, that is uh, perfectly okay, and it's also encouraged, and you can do so completely anonymously. I won't share your information with anyone. If you go down to the show notes of the video description, uh, you can see a number of ways to contact me uh, uh, personally, privately, uh, so you can uh, definitely uh, do that, um, especially if you're trying to reach out and you need help. Um, please uh, feel free uh, to do that. Uh, if you want to support this work, the best way for you to do that is to share uh, this content with someone who you think uh, needs uh, needs to hear this. Uh, so uh, please, please uh, do that. It's so important that you support uh, channels like this uh, uh, from a Christian uh, perspective. So uh, definitely, definitely please consider supporting channels uh, like this. So there are other ones out there from a secular uh, perspective. So just please, please, uh, please support uh, the Christian channels. Uh, please do that. Um, another way you can uh, support this work is by uh, leaving a review in Apple Podcasts. Uh, when you do that, it uh, helps the algorithm. So when people are searching for this podcast, uh, they will be able to, uh, or searching for just Jehovah's Witnesses in general in Apple Podcasts, they'll be able to find it. So even if you don't listen to this in Apple Podcasts, um, please, please consider uh, leaving me a five-star re review uh, for that reason. Uh, last and least, uh, it, uh, another way for you to support this is uh, financially by becoming a member of Patreon. Uh, you can uh, donate uh, $5 a month or up to $20 a month. Every little bit helps. This really helps uh, to keep the light on and also to improve uh, the quality uh, of uh, this uh, podcast. So thank you all so much who are uh, continuing to uh, donate. I really, really do appreciate it. It means uh, the world to me uh, and also means the world to me, everyone who's uh, supporting this podcast in every way. I'm greatly, greatly encouraged by that. So um, I hope you all have a great week and we will see you next week. For more information about Jehovah's Witnesses and other topics, please visit michaeljfelker.com. There you can also reach me directly to submit questions or comments to be covered on the JW Review. To subscribe to this podcast, please go to iTunes and search for the JW Review.